Otto H. Kahn was the third child of Bernhard and Emma Kahn. And he was born in 1867. The first son was Franz and he was a brilliant jurist who had had TB and died at the age of 43 or so in 1904 and in his last years, very severely ill, he joined his parents, Bernhard and Emma, who had decided to move from Mannheim, where the children were born, eight children, from Mannheim to Heidelberg, the university town. And because both Bernhard and Emma wanted to hear the lectures of the world's greatest brains who were at the University of Heidelberg. That's very characteristic of them. Self-improving and thirsty for knowledge until the end. And Otto H. H. for Hermann, that was the other firebrand of the revolution of 1848, Bernhard and Hermann, Hermann, my great-grandfather, uh, Otto H. was also brilliant, of course. It goes without saying. All, the, all, all our family were brilliant. That goes without saying. Anyhow, he was, he was such a gifted child. He played the violin and the cello even better than his older brother, the second son, Robert Kahn, who became a composer and spent his life in music. And when Hermann decided as a young kid he wanted to also devote his life to music or to the arts, his father said, out of the question, out of the question, you become a banker, we need somebody to carry on the bank and it's your job. And indeed, he gave up his desire to devote his full life to the arts and to decide to make money and become a banker on condition that he would devote whatever proceeds there were to the arts, to promoting and enjoying the arts. And money he made, tons of it, tons of it. He became by far the richest Khan ever. Otto H. Khan the Magnificent. An extraordinary career. He left Mannheim first for a year to do military service. He had to do that. But he became, he joined the Hussars and he was magnificent in a impeccable, lovely uniform. But he learned in that year in which he was in the army to detest the military life and above all to detest the Prussians. And all his life he detested the Prussians. I will say more about this in a minute. And then he went to Karlsruhe for two or three years to be an apprentice at some bank or other and I think also to Berlin. And then he went to London. When he was 21, he went to London, a lovely, lovely boy, handsome. He still wore a hussar, hussar's moustache, which later on was cut. And he felt thoroughly at home. He loved England. He loved London. And he was, he worked in the Deutsche Bank in the city of London, and within a very short time, he impressed his superior so much with his gifts 
that he became the second in command in no time. And those gifts, it's very hard to analyze what it is that makes a great banker, a great financial man. It is partly an analytical gift, including mathematics. And the, the, a scientific approach to money and, 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 and prospects and probabilities. And it is also a personality thing. He was the most engaging, smooth, amiable. The Kahn's always, I think that applies to most of them, all of them, wanted to be liked and were ingratiating and charming and suave and calm, unflappable. But I think the, the extraordinary gift Otto H. had was analytical. He saw at a glance what was interesting and what was not interesting. And those superiors in the Deutsche Bank in the city of London recognized it right away. In London also, he frequented the salon of his aunt Elizabeth Eberstadt, nee Eberstadt, his mother's sister, who had married that extraordinary lawyer, uh, George Lewis, later Sir George Lewis, and her name was Elizabeth, and she became Lady Lewis. And this lawyer was he was a solicitor, not a barrister, a solicitor. was everybody's solicitor in Victorian London. And I made that up. I said he was a solicitor of Jack the Ripper, but it might as well have been true. But it is not only that George Lewis had such distinguished and interesting clients, some of which were criminals, of course. He did a lot of criminal work also financial work, and was, was a, a whiz in libel uh, cases. And he had a huge practice. And Elizabeth, his wife, had a salon, and there was everybody was, everybody was in, in that salon. Anybody who was anybody in London frequented the salon of Lady Elizabeth Lewis on Portugal Place, near Regent's Park, in London. And there young Otto H., in his early 20s, met, named them, and he met them. He met Oscar Wilde. He met that great painter, John Sargent Singer, or is it the other way around, John, John Singer Sargent, who also painted his aunt. He met Gilbert and Sullivan, of course. And he met, named them, at Matt Paderewski, he met. And all the people in the arts, in the opera, and, and he went to everything. He went to the theater. He, he did everything. So one day, somebody from an American bank, a New York bank, uh, suggested that it might be a logical move for him to get a little American experience on Wall Street. That was an, he belonged to the Spire Bank. And Otto H. said, oh, well, why not? It's probably a good idea. There are a lot of bright people in Wall Street. And so he went to Wall Street uh, I, when he was 25 or 26. And there he arrived just at the beginning of the railway boom. And he had an eye for railways. He met that the king of railways, Harriman, Edward Harriman, a gruff, aggressive type. And Otto H. associated himself with, with Harriman, who had an eye for talent, and Otto H. was the exact opposite. He was calm, not a bit aggressive, and he was amiable. And they bared together, they were extremely complimentary. And they made a killing, he made a killing, he made a killing within a few years, yes. Uh, millions within a year, he was a millionaire. I mean, incredible, incredible, immediate and fast success. And it was not just buying and selling at all. 
it was organizing and reorganizing railways. He organized the Union Pacific Railway. He organized, there were three or four others, Baltimore, whatever. He, 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 was, he became extraordinarily skilled at, at also, also South America, also railways in South America. He became terrific. And this was a very, very, very remunerative. And uh, I don't know how this worked, but he became very rich and very quickly. And it was also a very smart move. He met Addie, A-D-D-I-E, I think, Addie, who was the daughter of, I don't know what his first name was, Wolf. And Wolf was with Kuhn Loeb, Kuhn Loeb, L-O-E-B, Kuhn Loeb, was a leading firm on Wall Street. And he met Addie, he met Addie, and married Addie. And after having married Addie, he joined Kuhn Loeb. And there was Jacob Schiff, there were a number of others, there were others, uh, other Jewish bankers, mainly from Germany, uh, described so vividly in a lovely book called Our Crowd. And there were the Lehman Brothers, and there the Guggenheims, and named them, and there they were. Uh, I can't remember all the names. But there were this, there were this, 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 this uh, yeah, Jacob Schiff was perhaps the best known of them all. And, and they were, um, they had something in common, and it's very important in the career of Otto H. They were very pro-German. They loved Germany, and Otto H. did not. Uh, and they detested the Russians. Because the Russians, they felt very Jewish, and the Russians had a anti-Semitism was official uh, policy in Tsarist Russia, and they identified with the oppressed Jews in Eastern Europe. Otto H didn't care very much about that. He was, I don't think he was very interested in that. This became very important later, and I might as well say it now. Why? In 1917, uh, America was ready to join in the war against Kaiser Wilhelm, the Germans. And Otto H. had been working towards that aim. He, had, he became quite political. He went to meetings. He was very political. He was the only of the Khan, of those eight Khan children, who had a political interest and ability. And he was very, very anxious for the United States to join the war against the Germans. Whereas all these others, the Kuhn Loeb crowd, the Jakob Schiff crowd, the Guggenheims, and the Lehman brothers, they were all aghast because they identified with Germany. And in 1917, by the way, uh, uh, Otto H. had become a British, a naturalized British subject while he was in London. But in 1917, he gave up his British nationality to become, an, to become an American. And he wrote a letter to his brother-in-law, Felix Deutsch. He had a correspondence with his family in Germany, and he wrote a long, long letter to his brother-in-law in, in Berlin, Felix Deutsch, in which he gave his reasons for being thoroughly opposed to Germany, hoping for the Germans to be crushed, German military, militarism to be destroyed, and making a point, which is very interesting looking back, that Germany could get everything they wanted without a war. And looking back, this is on the whole the view, a consensus among historians now. That was a very unnecessary war because Germany could have won it without a war, won all its, all its advantages. And you could look at Germany today 
which is the dominant power in, in, in continental Europe. That letter, 36 pages of it, an endless letter which he wrote to Felix Deutsch, was discovered by the French censorship. And they were, of course, extremely interest, interested in that. And they copied the letter, I don't know, maybe thousands of copies, and dropped the letter over to German lines. Interesting propaganda in the First World War that they used this kind of thing, which in the Second, in second World was commonplace. They, the, the French did this. The French dropped the letter of Otto H. Kahn blasting the Germans and 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 adding a word saying this is one of your old countrymen who said this. This is one of your own people who said this. And of course that letter was in German. And I don't know, I think I read somewhere that the Kaiser himself was so so upset, so incensed by this letter that he gave orders that if Otto H. was ever on a ship going back to Europe, that ship should be torpedoed, or something like that. Uh, uh, after the war, Otto H. was very active in financial aid to lending money to the young Weimar Republic. And he went to Germany quite often. By the way, I should mention that in 1911, before the, three years before the outbreak of war, <coughs> he'd gone back to Europe and he rented a castle, Casio Berry, C-A-S-E-O Berry, B-U-R-I, in Somerset in England. He rented a castle for a few weeks and he and he invited his German relatives to spend a few days with him. And uh, there is a report, a letter, which I have seen uh, from his sister, Lily, say who was there and said, well, it was all very nice, but at this time I didn't really feel very much at home in England. Uh, but... I was really not very much impressed by all that showing off of my older brother. What am I talking about? My younger brother, Otto H. I'm not very much impressed by all that money and all that showing off. And I felt more German than ever. And I returned home more chauvinistic German than ever. That was an ironical outcome of that gathering in the, in the, in the uh, castle in Somerset in England. Anyhow, in the 20s, Otto H. returned to Germany a few times. And uh, he was very prescient on the whole. At the, in the, uh, uh, in the, during the crash in 1929, and I think he lost very little money. In in uh, the states, on the whole, his children were baptized. He had he had no religion, but he had he was interested in the Catholic Church, and he was considering becoming a Catholic because he liked the music in Catholic churches. Then he had no feeling for. Uh, uh, the, 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 the music or the absence of music in synagogues. And, but once Hitler was in power in 1933, he went public and confessed himself to be a Jew and said, this is a time when we have to make common cause, all Jews have to be common cause against that monster. One day he was walking down Fifth Avenue, so the story goes, and a hunchback stopped him 
and said, Mr. Khan, around the corner here on that street, there is a new synagogue. I think perhaps you'd be interested in having a look at it. And Otto H. said to him, My dear man, what makes you think I'm Jewish? And the hunchback said, What makes you think I'm a hunchback? Well, that must have happened a year or two before before this became critical and before Hitler was in power, which he was, he seized power, I mean, he didn't seize power, he became Chancellor in, on January the 30th, 1933, and by then he was not well, Otto H. was not well, he had a heart problem. And in 1934, he died on his estate. On his estate on the north shore of Long Island. Cold Arbor. Cold Arbor, something like that. Long Island. Um, and when I say estate, I don't just mean an ordinary estate. This was an estate. It was the second largest private residence in the United States of America. It was huge. It was huge. Versailles was nothing compared to it. It had 20, 126 rooms. 120, 126 rooms and 127 servants, or maybe it was the other way around. It was huge, and it had a golf course, and, and it inspired Scott Fitzgerald when he wrote The Great Gatsby. And it still exists, it's called Ohika, Otto H, Ohika, O-H-E-K-A. It is now a kind of hotel, and uh, used for conventions. And and uh, you can go there any time. You can re live there. You can rent a room. And if you want to get married, that is the place to get married in. And a lot of people do because it is hugely uh, of great visual interest <laughs> to be married in such a such a idiotically luxurious surrounding. And. Uh, and it was, in fact, in the 20s, the place where huge parties took place. It's just, it fits into the Great Gatsby's perfectly. Everybody was there. Everybody was there. And since Otto H. was not only at home on Wall Street, so a lot of money people were there, Otto H. was not only at home in the Republican Party, where he had many friends, and Fred often thought of uh, running for something, but I don't think he ever did. What he really wanted, while he was still a British citizen, was to get a, uh, a seat in the House of Lords. That is, he considered that the most desirable thing in the world. He didn't make it, but his granddaughter, his granddaughter, 18 years after his death, Virginia Ryan married Lord Ogilvy, the 13th Earl of Airlie, a Scottish peer, a Scottish peer, Airlie, A-I-R-L-I-E. And Lord Ogilvy has a younger brother who is married to Alexandra of Kent, the daughter of the Duke of Kent. So, so, uh, in, in in that sense, he didn't make it, Otto H. didn't make it, the House of Lords, but his granddaughter did, or rather, her husband. And uh, that, but that is not the main reason why Otto H.'s legacy is so extraordinary. 
it is because he had in fact become the Mycenas, the Croesus, the, uh, the the great philanthropist, the man that, who created the modern Metropolitan Opera. It was he. He was chairman of the board of the Metropolitan Opera for I don't I don't know many decades. He covered the deficit every year. Can you imagine? He covered single-handedly the deficit of the opera, and he it was he who attracted many of the great stars and the great musical figures. He, he attracted Toscanini to come to the United States. It was he who got Caruso to come to the Met and many other singers. Not only the Met, Broadway plays, uh, the theatre. Uh, he c collected paintings. He had a Rembrandt. He had a Rembrandt. There are very few Rembrandts in their private houses. He had a Rembrandt, portrait of a student, and when he died, his heirs had it auctioned off. And it is now in the uh, Cleveland uh, Art Gallery. He was, and, and his wife was very active in all these things too. But especially in the collection of he had very good taste. In 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 attract in 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 in, in, in buying pictures, this was the time, that was a generation, Otto H's generation, where there were the great collectors, the Mellons and the others who were, who had extraordinary, collections of art, and Otto H had to compete with that. And, uh, on, the estate he built, in the the Vanderbilts of other great houses are nearby. And it is extraordinary that the, the, the lavish scale in which he practiced what he had decided to do when he was only a teenager. <laughs>